Hatchet, Chapter 14. Brian surely has found ways to survive. He also is learning more and more about the ways of the wilderness and is using that to help him survive. In Chapter 13, he created a bow and arrow that he used to catch fish to eat. More importantly, he was not successful at his first few attempts, but he did not give up. He kept trying and trying and thinking and thinking and analyzing and analyzing until he remembered that water refracts or bends light. So he had to aim below where he thought the fish were to catch them, and he did. He caught many and had a feast day as he cooked fish over the fire and ate like a king. So let's see what Brian does in chapter 14. Mistakes. Small mistakes could turn into disasters. Funny little mistakes could snowball so that while you were still smiling at the humor, you could find yourself looking at death. In the city, if he made a mistake, usually there was a way to rectify it. Make it all right. If he fell on his bike and sprained a leg, he could wait for it to heal. If he forgot something at the store, he could find other food in the refrigerator. Now it was different and all so quick, all so incredibly quick. If he sprained a leg here, he might starve before he could get around again. If he missed while he was hunting or if the fish moved away, he might starve. If he got sick, really sick, so he couldn't move, he might starve. Mistakes. Early in the new time, he had learned the most important thing, the truly, truly vital knowledge that drives all creatures in the forest. Food is all. Food was simply everything. All things in the woods, from insects to fish to bears, were always, always looking for food. If it was, it was the great single driving influence in nature to eat. All must eat. But the way he learned it almost killed him. His second new night, stomach full of fish and the fire smoldering in the shelter, he had been sound asleep when something, he thought later it might be a smell, had awakened him. Near the fire, completely unafraid of the smoking coals, completely unafraid of Brian, a skunk was digging where he had buried the eggs. There was some sliver of a moon, and in the faint pearl light, he could see the bushy tail, the white stripes down the back, and he had nearly smiled. He did not know how the skunk had found the eggs. Some smell, perhaps some tiny fragment of a shell, had left a smell, but it looked almost cute. Its little head down and its little tail up as it dug and dug, kicking the sand back. But those were his eggs, not the skunk's, and the half-smile had been quickly replaced with the fear that he would lose his food, and he had grabbed a handful of sand and thrown it at the skunk. Get out of here! He was going to say more, more silly human words, but in less than half a second, the skunk had snapped its rear end up, curved the tail over, and sprayed Brian with a direct shot aimed at his head from less than four feet away. In the tiny confines of the shelter, the effect was devastating. The thick, sulfurous, rotten odor filled the small room, heavy, ugly, and stinking. The corrosive spray that hit his face seared into his lungs and eyes, blinding him. He screamed and threw himself sideways, taking the entire wall off the shelter, screamed and clawed out of the shelter, and fell ran to the shore of the lake, stumbling and tripping. He scrambled into the water and slammed his head back and forth, trying to wash his eyes, slashing at the water to clear his eyes. A hundred funny cartoons he had seen about skunks. Cute cartoons about the smell of skunks. Cartoons to laugh at and joke about. But when the spray hit, there was nothing funny about it. He was completely blinded for almost two hours. A lifetime, he thought, that he might be permanently blind, or at least impaired. And that would have been the end. And it was a pain in his eyes lasted for days. Bothered him after that for two weeks. The smell in the shelter, in his clothes, and in his hair was still there almost a month and a half later, and he had nearly smiled. Mistakes. Food had to be protected. While he was in the lake trying to clear his eyes, the skunk went ahead and dug up the rest of the turtle eggs and ate every one, licked all the shells clean, and couldn't have cared less that Brian was thrashing around in the water like a dying carp. The skunk had found food and was taking it, and Brian was paying for a lesson. Protect food and have a good shelter. Not just a shelter to keep the wind and rain out, but a shelter to protect, a shelter to make him safe. The day after the skunk, he set about making a good place to live. The basic idea had been good. The place for his shelter was right. But he just hadn't gone far enough. He'd been lazy. But now he knew the second most important thing about nature. What drives nature? Food was first, but the work for the food went on and on. Nothing in nature was lazy. He had tried to take a shortcut and paid for it with his turtle eggs, which he had come to like more than chicken eggs from the store. They had been fuller somehow, had more depth to them. He set about improving his shelter by tearing it down. From dead pines up the hill, he brought down heavier logs and fastened several of them across the opening, wedging them up at the top 
and burying the bottoms in the sand. Then he wove long branches in through them to make a truly tight wall, and still not satisfied, he took even thinner branches and wove those into the first weave. When he was at last finished, he could not find a place to put his fist through. It all held together like a very stiff woven basket. He judged the door opening to be the weakest spot, and here he took special time to weave a door of willows in so tight a mesh that no matter how a skunk tried or porcupine, he thought, looking at the marks on his legs, it could not possibly get through. He had no hinges, but by arranging some cut-off limbs at the top in the right way, he had a method to hook the door in place. And when he was in the door, was hung, he felt relatively safe. A bear, something big, could still get in by tearing at it, but nothing small could bother him and the weave of the structure still allowed the smoke to filter up through the top and out. All in all, it took him three days to make the shelter, stopping to shoot fish and eat as he went, bathing four times a day to try to get the smell from the skunk to leave. When his house was done, finally done right, he turned to the constant problem, food. It was all right to hunt and eat or fish and eat, but what happened if he had to go a long time without food? What happened when the berries were gone and he got sick or hurt or thinking of the skunk laid up temporarily? He needed a way to store food a place to store it, and he needed food to store. Mistakes. He learned from mistakes. He couldn't bury food again, couldn't leave it in the shelter, because something like a bear could get at it right away. It had to be high, somehow high and safe. Above the door to the shelter, up the rock face about 10 feet, was a small ledge that could make a natural storage place unreachable to animals, except that it was unreachable to him as well. So pausing here and pointing to you, that's where this is. Brian kind of sees a shelter, I mean, a ledge of rock above his shelter. Um, a ladder, of course, he needed a ladder, but he had no way to fashion one, nothing to hold the steps on. And that stopped him until he found a dead pine with many small branches still sticking out. Using his hatchet, he chopped the branches off so they stuck out four or five inches, all up along the log. Then he cut the log off about 10 feet long and dragged it to his shelter. It was a little heavy, but dry, and he could manage it. And when he propped it up, he found he could climb to the ledge with ease. Though the trees did, the tree did roll from side to side a bit as he climbed. So he kind of makes a ladder out of um, the dead pine tree, and he cuts the branches so they're like rungs on the ladder. And then he also, oops, he also takes the he make he weaves a willow and puts that in front of um, the rock ledge for when he has food um, saved there. Uh, he he can he can keep the the willow little door there to protect uh, from birds flying in and getting it. Okay, so I'm going to go to page 134. His food shelf, as he thought of it, had been covered with bird manure, and he carefully scraped it clean with sticks. He'd never seen birds there. That was probably because the smoke from his fire went up right across the opening, and they didn't like smoke. Still, he had learned, and he took time to weave a snug door with a small opening with green willows, cutting it so it jammed in tightly. And when he finished, he stood back and looked at the rock face, his shelter below, the food shelf above, and allowed a small bit of pride to come. Not bad, he had thought. Not bad for somebody who used to have trouble greasing the bearings on his bicycle. Not bad at all. Mistakes. He had made a good shelter and food shelf, but he had no food except for fish and the rest of the berries. And the fish, as good as they still tasted then, were not something he could store. His mother had left some salmon out by mistake one time when they went on an overnight trip to Cape Hesper to visit relatives. When they got back, the smell filled the whole house. There was no way to store fish. At least, he thought, no way to store them dead. But as he looked at the weave of his structure, a thought came to him, and he moved down to the water. He had been putting the waste from the fish back in the water, and the food had attracted hundreds of new ones. I wonder. They seemed to come easily to the food, at least the small ones. He had no trouble now shooting them, and he had even speared one with his old fish spear now that he knew to aim low. He could dangle something in his fingers, and they came right up to it. It might be possible, he thought, might just be possible to trap them, make some kind of pond. To his right, at the base of the rock bluff, there were piles of smaller rocks that had fallen from the main chunk, splinters and hunks, from double fist size to some as large as his head. He spent an afternoon carrying rocks to the beach and making what amounted to a large pen for holding live fish. Two rock arms that struck, stuck out 15 feet into the lake and curved together at the end. Where the arms came together, he left an opening about two feet across. Then he sat on the shore and waited. So this is what Brian has here. He, I kind of took a picture of the lake and made, uh, drew in some rocks here. And then he's also going to weave a willow door so he can lift it to let fish in and then close it so it traps him in there. So continuing reading. 
When he had first started dropping the rocks, all the fish had darted away. But his fish trash pile of bones and skin and guts was in the pond area, and the prospect of food brought them back. Soon, under an hour, there were 30 or 40 small fish in the enclosure. And Brian made a gate by weaving small fish, small willows together into a fine mesh and closed them in. Fresh fish, he had yelled, I have fresh fish for sale. Storing live fish to eat later had been a major breakthrough, he thought. It wasn't just keeping from starving. It was trying to save ahead, think ahead. Of course, he didn't know that, how sick he would get of fish. Okay, so there we go. So the final frame here says Brian is a smart survivor. So he's survived so far um, and he's being successful and he's learning more and more about nature every day. So that is the end of chapter 14. So please do your assignment in Google Classroom and I will see you guys tomorrow.